Yeah, so I'm Bernard and going to be talking about Go without the operating system. So I think it's clear since we're at GopherCon why we're talking about Go, but maybe it's the question, in, like, why are we talking about operating systems and why do we want to get rid of them, right? They're pretty useful things. I think I probably couldn't put together this presentation without an operating system. So there's, there's a bit of context here to, to think about. In particular, I'm not talking about in a development environment. Um, this is where our operating systems really shine. I'm thinking about deployment and um, like what your program that you want to do is doing in production. Um, so let's, let's take a look at what a, a deploy, deployment process might look like. This is a kind of conventional deployment. You have some physical hardware somewhere, maybe it's in a data center or it's in your closet, something like this. And you know, the thing that you're paid to do is you're writing applications and you want to run them somewhere. So you want to run them on this hardware that you happen to have. And the operating system is what allows you to do this. It uh, sits in between the hardware and your applications and allows you to safely make use of the hardware and um, share it between the different processes. But you probably don't deploy like this anymore. Most of us don't. Many have now switched to it's kind of cloud deployments. And it looks really similar, except that you actually are not in control of the physical hardware. This, this hardware is shared. Um, so there's a, there's a separate kind of tool. It's called a hypervisor. Um, and this allows multiple operating systems to share an interface directly with hardware. And if you think back to the, the conventional deployment, in this case, there's actually a lot of duplicated work here. If you treat the cloud deployment the same kind of way as you treat the conventional deployment, because the operating system is allowing multiple programs to share hardware that's already being shared between multiple operating systems by this other tool. And, and that kind of makes you wonder, you're thinking about, OK, this, there's a lot of duplicated work here, but you know, that's, that's OK. I mean, we rely on operating systems for a lot of other things, too. Um, you know, they're providing a, a general purpose computing environment. We can, we can SSH in and run a shell script and set up a cron job. Um, we're running lots of different applications, doing different kinds of workloads. Um, they're also well-established products, which are also built on top of other well-established products and tools. Um, and they have many years, or you know, in some cases, decades of you know, time in production and, and development expertise. The, the kind of flip side to that is that they're also very large projects. Um, it's, it's not uncommon that on a server um, setup, you could have 500 software packages running uh, or installed, you know, coming from hundreds of millions of lines of source code. Uh, the, the Linux kernel alone is around 15 million lines of code. And, and this has impacts on a lot of different things. You know, I want to call out in particular performance here. Um, you know, there's been a tremendous amount of engineering time put into the Linux kernel for performance around uh, scheduling of processes and uh, networking. The, the flip side to that is that it's engineering time spent trying to make it perform as best as possible, given the constraints of trying to run a bunch of different things, doing different workflows at the same time. Uh, there are also some potential security implications here. Um, you know, in, in these hundreds of packages that you have installed, maybe you, your own program doesn't depend on it. Maybe someone else's program depends on this thing. Uh, but that one, uh, one kind of vulnerability in this, this system can impact the entire system. So what would it look like if we got rid of the operating system? You know, what would that mean? And I think you know, if you're thinking about a cloud deployment, then we could remove the operating system if our user applications could talk directly to the hypervisor. Um, these kinds of hypervisor-aware applications are called unikernels. Uh, this is the term that everyone is kind of talking about for these kinds of topics. Um, and where the, the operating system is a general purpose kind of tool, the hypervisor is very specialized. It's about running one program and executing it well. There are a number of different 
styles of these um, tools. And well, some are used for operating systems research. So it's a operating system as a library. You, uh, maybe you're researching um, new device driver models, and so you can kind of use an existing memory manager and process scheduler, but you supply your own device driver. Uh, the other style are targeted at language runtimes, so making uh, normal programs that don't know about the hypervisor able to run uh, unmodified. And there are a number of them for languages like Haskell, Erlang, OCaml, and of course, Go. So, Atman OS is um, a project that I started a little over six months ago, and it is for creating uh, Go unikernels. And what that means is that it allows you to take ordinary, unmodified Go programs and cross-compile them to run directly on the Zen hypervisor, uh, just like you might cross-compile for Linux or Windows from your Mac. Um, these, these resulting um, build artifacts can then be deployed to places like EC2, uh, Rackspace Cloud, um, or your own uh, data centers. And the, the project itself is made up of a few pieces. Um, the kind of lowest level is a microkernel, which is implemented entirely in Go with a little bit of assembly. Um, there are then a, a kind of suite of libraries for you know, interacting with this microkernel, for communicating with Zen, dealing with networking, things of this nature. Um, and then there's the, the kind of smallest bit, which is the porting Go's runtime and standard library to those, those libraries and packages. Um, the, the project at the moment is about 3,000 lines of code and just a little bit of assembly as well. So I want to dig into like, what these individual pieces are. The, the microkernel is the, the general purpose part of this very special purpose um, environment. Uh, so it provides the minimum necessary to implement Go's runtime. So these are the things like accessing and mapping memory, um, creating threads and switching between them, uh, responding to uh, timers and network events, um, and uh, keeping track of the progress of time. Uh, this is implemented directly within the runtime package. Um, and this is because it is a very special Go code. It is, it is Go, uh, but it, it has a lot of kind of little caveats that are similar to what you would see if you look at the implementation of the runtime. The, the kind of trouble with implementing a kernel in Go is that uh, you can't allocate memory before you've implemented a memory manager, and you can't have processes before you can schedule them. Um, and so it has to do some special things. So there are, you know, some, some pieces are implemented in assembly, like the bootstrap process and uh, context switching between threads. Uh, there's a good deal of unsafe, as we like, saw in the, the last talk. There are some similar ones. We have to do some pointer arithmetic. Um, there's also, for interacting with Zen, there's a lot of um, shared memory structures, which we then have to kind of move back and forth between domains. Um, there are some special um, annotations that you can add to functions within the runtime um, that Atman makes use of. Uh, for example, the uh, no write barrier prevents the compiler from inserting write barriers. This is so that um, these functions can run while these are functions that the garbage collector depends on and therefore can't run at the same time as the garbage collector. Um, and you're unable to allocate memory on the heap, so you have to uh, do some things like uh, pre-allocating some space before jumping into a particular spot. The, the next layer up from that are all of the, the system, system libraries. And these provide like, user space access to the internals of this, the, the kernel and, and Zen itself. Uh, for example, there's the MM package for interacting with the memory manager. This allows you to allocate physical pages, map frames into memory. Uh, these are the sort of things that you need in order to 
communicate with Zen. There's then the Zen package, which is, uh, implements the kind of core Zen um, types and functions. These are things like um, event channels for getting notifications. And then there are a bunch of, a number of assorted other libraries um, that kind of exist in this space but are needed for implementing the standard library itself. Um, so the, the Zen store package is for interacting with um, what's called Zen store. It's a, on a Zen host that runs a small uh, key value store for configuration um, and coordination. You need that in order to implement the network drivers, which is the next one. Um, and there's also a net IP package, which is going to be an, a TCP IP implementation necessary for implementing Go's own net stack. And then there's the, the port of Go, and, and this is what allows ordinary programs that don't know anything about this to be run directly on Zen. Um, it's, there are um, a number of uh, functions and types which kind of each target architecture or operating system needs to implement in order for Go to be able to compile programs. Um, for the, the runtime, that's things like managing memory, time, creating and destroying processes, acquiring locks. For the standard library, it's the kind of operating system specific things like syscall functions and, and network types. And those are the, the kind of core pieces that, that make up the OpenOS project. So I'd like to show some, some code and, and do a little demo of something. Um, the, the kind of funny thing with this is that because it is a port of Go, um, the normal Go programs are the same no matter what it is. So the hello world for Atman OS is not any different than the hello world for Linux or Mac or something like this. And I think six years ago, it would have been a great demo to show that you could take the hello world run on the Mac and cross compile it and run it on Linux. I think we need a little bit more here. So I want to actually show what um, one of the, these kind of system level packages is around networking. And then I wrote a little demo program that uses it um, to show some things. So I'm here in the um, in Atman's net package. Um, we've got a couple of imports. I need the access to the memory manager. I need to talk to Zen. Um, and I also need to use the configuration store. This is Zen store. The main entry point here is this init networking. That's going to set up the default network device that our, um, our program will eventually be using. It does a bit of, uh, the kind of setup here is that it needs to know uh, where the, um, the other half of this, this driver is. The way that it, it works is that you have a small, small bit implemented in your own uh, code here and Zen manages the actual physical hardware. So we're gonna interface with Zen rather than talking to like an ethernet card. Um, so we need to find out where, where this is and we use the Zen store to, to look up this information. We can grab it, we store it. Um, we create a new event channel um, and this is going to be like uh, interrupts on a, on a processor but we can take this, uh, we register a new event channel with with Zen, and Zen will deliver notifications on this. Um, and what we're going to do is we're gonna pass a reference to this channel to the back end so that uh, they know where we want to receive our notifications. We're gonna set up, set up some shared structures. This is how we're gonna communicate back and forth with, the, um, with Zen. Um, in order to do that, we need to actually create page-aligned um, structures. This is something that you can't get with um, ordinary uh, Go uh, functions, so we have to use this uh, memory management package to actually get a physical page that we can get some references, information about. Um, and we're gonna create a, a ring buffer, um, and this is how we pass information back and forth. It's, uh, there are two of them. There's one TX and RX for things that we're sending and things that we're receiving. Um, and what we, we will pass along that is um, uh, references to pages of data. So we're going to send a bunch of uh, requests over to Zen. Um, 
down uh, here, we're going to, for the, the RX ones here, this is what we're kind of uh, going to be taking a look at. We come here for, for each of these buffers that we're setting up. We, uh, we allocate a page, and then we, we grant access to this page to the back end. Um, this is going to allow them to actually read this data, uh, read and write data. And then we push that reference um, into the uh, queue here. So we're going to pass it along to the back end so that when their network packet comes in, it will write some data there and send it back to us so that we can do some things with it. After that, we, there's some mechanisms here where we um, talk to uh, Zen to register the device. We're going to write some information to that store. Um, and then we're going to come along and finalize the connection, deal with some uh, last bit of uh, state there. And at the very end, assuming all of that works, we have a device that's configured and ready to uh, read and write some network packets. Uh, so that's what I, um, I've written a small program that's going to use this library. Um, when it starts up, it's going to print uh, the MAC address of this device and some information about it. Um, and then it's going to start re listening for packets coming in, and it's going to read the, the header and print out a little bit of information about what it found. Um, so let's go ahead and, and build this um, example. Uh, Atman is here. Is, um, it's a wrapper around the go command. So Atman build is like go OS equals Atman go build. Um, so in the Atman OS example package, there's a net main which we're going to build and put it in. Um, I'm running this locally right now, so I have a Vagrant machine that's running Zen. They're going to send the um, send our compiled uh, artifact over there. So it built something. Um, what did it What did it build? Uh, the The output of an Atman build is an ELF executable. Um, from kind of like this perspective, it's going to be identical to the results of building something for Linux, uh, as far as the uh, structure here. Um, there are a couple of special, um, a special things set on this, this executable that tell Zen kind of what to do, um, if we look at. Um, there are some notes that are prefixed with Zen um, kind of attached to this, this binary. Um, this uh, Zen loader tells Zen that it is, in fact, something that is expected to be run on Zen. There's some version information for feature negotiation. And uh, this, this note is always cut off, but it uh, says hypercall page. And this is a... Um, a reference to a place inside of an address inside of the binary where Zen can put some data that's necessary for bootstrapping the whole thing. All right, so I'm going to take this this binary and ship it over to my Vagrant machine, which I have running over here. Um, and let's uh, start a VM. You're going to attach a console. And uh, I've set up a, a bridge network that's local to, to here that it's going to use as its um, network interface. Oh, look at that. <laughs> All right, so at uh, startup, it's going to print out some, some debugging information from Atman OS here. Um, this is some of the some of the information that we is used for communicating with Zen, um, and somewhere in here, yeah, here we go. So this is the the part that the demo program does. It, um, reads that uh, d grabs that device that was initialized in the network package. It prints out uh, its MAC address, uh, and then starts dumping out some packets. And actually, it receives some right away. 
Um, but we missed those, so I'm going to send some manually here to that uh, MAC address that it said. If it works, no. And there we go. Now we're receiving some network packets. You can see that it's uh, coming from the, uh, the Vagrant host. The destination is that uh, MAC address that we saw. And in this case, it's sending IPv4 packets. Yeah, thank you. It actually worked. OK, so we've uh, seen some, some of Atman. So what's the kind of status of this, this project? I mentioned that it's about uh, six months old. Um, I'm gonna describe some of the, the things that are there right now. So it's a single processor uh, system with cooperatively scheduled threads. Um, you might be wondering about the uh, threads and processes in the context of Go. Um, but this is something that's required to, for the runtime uh, and that um, uh, Go, when it starts up, it runs your program in one thread, um, but it also starts up threads for the garbage collector and a couple of other things. Um, and these need to be able to uh, switch back and forth between each other as needed. Um, there's also a memory manager. It does not use paging, um, at least at the moment. So the, um, there are some workloads where if you need to um, take a whole bunch of memory that you only expect to use a small portion of, it may not uh, work for that, that flow, at least yet. Uh, it has high precision timing. This comes from uh, its interface with Zen. This allows you to, you know, when you sleep for 10 nanoseconds, that it sleeps for roughly 10 nanoseconds, and it keeps track of time um, in a very precise way. There's a debug console for writing information and reading out uh, logs later. Uh, there's like the basic infrastructure for implementing networking, as well as for interacting with Zen from like outside of the Atman OS project. So. Um, the, the, a lot of the kind of system libraries that are currently in the Atman project, those could also be implemented outside of Atman, like in your own application. If you wanted to write your own device driver or something like that, uh, that could actually be done now. And so then where, where is it going? What's next? Um, there are a couple of, of places uh, to go. I think uh, one, one place is adding a preemptive scheduler. Um, it's, uh, it's something I'm a little hesitant to do because the, the cooperative scheduler is really nice and simple. Um, but there are a couple of runtime tests which fail without a preemptive scheduler. Uh, and so I'm not totally sure yet whether that's uh, something that could or should be addressed in the runtime or whether it actually must be a preemptive scheduler. Um, there are some new developments in recent versions of Go that allow the runtime to import packages. Um, and I'd really like to make use of this for taking the microkernel, which is currently mixed up with the runtime, and pulling it out into its own separate packages that are used by the runtime. Um, the testing is a really interesting topic for this, because the tests, you can't run Go tests until the entire runtime and most of the standard library works. Um, so there's not a lot of room for we're writing kind of like new tests in here. And so now as it's, the project has become more stable, I'm looking for uh, kind of strategies for uh, exploring how to kind of test a system like this. Um, the, the biggest thing then here is finishing the TCP IP stack. And this is like a huge undertaking, but it's, it's really exciting. Um, and I think there's an opportunity as well to uh, kind of implement it in a way so that the, the package could be used um, outside of Atman uh, for um, other kind of user space networking stacks. Um, some places, or potential places for future exploration. Um, I'd love to get pprof support in there. Uh, I think it would be really interesting to be able to, you know, have your program running in production, you attach a profiler to it, and you see not only your program, but actually everything related to your program. So you would see where your network time is actually being spent. You would be able to drill into the process scheduler and kind of all of the details of the entire system. 
Um, I don't have any concrete plans for kind of uh, block storage and file systems, and I have a lot of open questions about how exactly that might work with the OS uh, package, but that's a place to kind of look into. Um, and perhaps um, going into a, a multiprocessor aware um, scheduler and threading system. Um, I think for, for many programs, it, it works quite well having the dedicated processor, but there are obviously workloads where that's not a great fit, and that would be a nice place to, uh, to go into. Um, with that, I want to thank you all. I uh, encourage you. I'm going to be at the uh, Q&A this afternoon. I'm also going to be at the Hack Day tomorrow and generally around the conference. If you have any questions about the stuff that I talked about or if you want to uh, get a demo of the project, get, dig some more into the code, uh, just come and find me. Thank you.